All right, guys, welcome back to the Investor Mindset Podcast. I am very excited, but when am I not excited? I have Steve Littman in the studio today. How are you doing, Steve? Living the dream, man. How are you? I am doing well. A brother with the same name. He's got to be a good guy. Steve Libman is an incredible experienced investor. And after spending years wholesaling, flipping, and developing residential land, he's now solely focused on raising capital for large commercial projects. Steve is an active member and sits on the board of their church, sits on the Rutgers Advisory Board on Design Thinking, and has been published in Forbes multiple times this year. We're super excited to have, have you, buddy. You ready to jump into things? Thanks, man. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I know you well, and so I know that you've hit success in my book, but why don't we, take, why don't we start out by taking a look back? What events or influences from your childhood shaped who you are today? Yeah, I love that you start with this question, by the way, Um, because I knew you'd ask it and I had to give it some thought. So it was, um, it wasn't a path that was really laid out, you know, from the beginning for me. I would say an influential person in my life that helped shape my thinking about even being an entrepreneur was my um, grandfather on my dad's side. And I was actually adopted when I was five years old by my father. So my mom and my father got married when I was young. He adopted me. And then this, uh, this new family kind of adopted us too. And my grandfather started STS Tires, which is Somerset Tire Service in New Jersey. Mm. And he sold it to the big company that you know of as STS now. Um, so he was an entrepreneur. He came from Liverpool to escape the war and he lived in a gas station until he bought that gas station. And then he started a tire business and, you know, through the depression became very successful through that tire business. And, uh, and he lived a successful life. He was being, he was able to pass legacy on to his kids. Um, and that was an exciting, uh, person to watch. Right. And even though we didn't, he didn't get to see me become an entrepreneur, he passed. Um, he was influential in that, in that perspective while, you know, kind of shaping my thought processes about, do I go out and get a job or do I kind of start my own business? And even though I went to college and went the, the similar route that a lot of us take, um, I ended up looking at entrepreneurship as a really exciting place to be. So, so that influenced me a lot for, for business. Um, it sounds like, and- it sounds like your grandpa was a, a entrepreneur. He had started that business from scratch, sold it. And what did you take away from that? Well, I, first it was um, the freedom that he had. You know, I, I saw that he had financial freedom. He was able to go on trips whenever he wanted. He took the family on trips. Um, you know, I also saw that where he kind of fell short in training up his children in um, in different ways and kind of passing on that financial aptitude or education, um, where I wanted to be really much better at that and understanding that we could talk about money, right? It was, he had money, never talked about money and it never kind of flowed through the generations. So, you know, at least in my household, right? Maybe it was different for other siblings of my dad's, but um, it also showed me that just by having money doesn't educate you about money or being around money doesn't necessarily educate you about money. You still need to understand it, educate yourself about it and get a background in it. So it encouraged me to be an entrepreneur because I saw the freedom that it created, but it also made me recognize that, Hey, you don't have to not talk about money. It doesn't have to be taboo. It can be a tool that's utilized for things that you want to get done in your life, whether that's giving or traveling or, you know, any number of things. So I wanted to understand it more holistically, right? Instead of just having success over here and how that does that apply, it really helped open my mind up to saying, okay, so having money is one piece of it. Mm-hmm. Keeping money, preserving wealth, passing it on generationally, that's a separate thing. And that also comes with its own lessons and own education that you have to explore. I, I love that. I love that so much. I feel like it's, it's amazing to me how in a person that's two generations from you, can have such a big influence on the direction that you're taking today, right? I I can relate a lot. My grandfather was an entrepreneur and uh, there's quite a story there, but just, and and he passed away when I was young, but even that the memory of him and the things that he did still affect me today. And so that's so cool to remember that 
the things that you're doing right now are going to affect your grandchildren. And so setting that right, yeah. setting yeah, that right cool. for them is going to make a difference. Yeah, hundred percent. So tell us a little bit about what you are focused on today. What is it that you do um, in the investing space? Yeah. So we have recently, so you and I met right in a single family residential mastermind. And that was an incredible experience helping blow up our business, become more profitable, things like that. Um, and it was always a tool for us. My goal was always long-term passive wealth creation. I didn't know exactly how we would do that, whether that would be through single families or duplexes or quads. Um, our first, you know, commercial deal I always thought would be some something like that, right? In the residential space, because we're finding residential deals in our wholesale and flip business. So I thought it would be a natural progression. It wasn't. We started looking at some other mentors of ours that have uh, thousands of units under management into the large commercial space, meaning multifamily, self-storage, uh, student housing. And so we started doing some study. You know, what what does um, what are the benefits and detriments of both spaces? Why would we want to do one versus the other? And so we made the decision in the last 18 months to go full-time commercial, commercial real estate uh, in those three asset classes that I just mentioned. And we really did it because of stability, right? We're looking for that stability, consistency, and safety. Um, you know, my dad passed away about six years ago. He lost a good percentage of his wealth during the downturn and then didn't live to live long enough to watch it rebound. So the money that he lost in the stock market, I recognized the volatility in it. I was already in real estate at that time and I just liked it more. So, but I also saw the volatility in residential markets as we saw in the downturn. So I wanted to kind of explore, you know, is there a safer asset class to be in? Wall Street was out for me. Residential, um, although profitable and gave us a great earned income, wasn't a long-term retirement plan. So as we started recognizing that these larger assets were much more stable, that's where we went into. So our first deal was a $14 million self-storage complex that we built ground up, almost 1,200 units, and a stabilized value of almost $30 million once it's up and running. So we, we kind of dove right in. Right. So when people say, what do you do now? Really what we do is we try to educate people in, in the space and try to get them to understand that there is stability, consistency and safety in these larger assets more so than some of their other investments and can give them the opportunity to partner with us and, and jump in with those deals. Yeah. Well, what I really take away from that is that anybody can make a move to a different sector if they want to. I, I feel like, uh, especially in the single family space, a lot of people feel limited. Like, well, once I'm in this space, I can't really go and do commercial deals. That's that's so much bigger. That's so much different. And it is. Um, and, and just as you mentioned, you know, a lot of us get into real estate or investing of any type or starting a business or entrepreneurship so that we can have that financial freedom, that freedom that you talked about that right. your grandfather had. But when you actually get into it, you've really created yourself a job. And especially in the single family space, the wholesaling, the flipping space. I mean, you can get away, you can take some yeah. time off, but you're earning income. And it's not always stable because there is ups and downs and deals fall through and things happen. And when it, when it happens, it sucks because you thought, yeah. well, hey, I thought I was going to get that cash flow that I came in here for. And instead, I'm just earning money on every deal. And I'm not really banking it away into properties that are paying me off. So it's, it's cool to see you make that transition. Yeah. And you and I have spoken about this recently, right? Because I think we have a similar mindset on what that freedom looks like and how to achieve it. And I love the flipping business. I, I'm really grateful to it. It got me to where we are today, but you're hundred percent right in that it's an earned income business, right? If you read Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant, you're mm-hmm. in as an entrepreneur or a small business owner, you are in the you've worked yourself into the highest tax bracket that exists. W-2 employees pay less taxes than we do. As entrepreneurs, we pay the highest tax. As large businesses like Amazon and Google, they pay less tax. And then the commercial real estate investor pays almost nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of reasons through the IRS tax code that that is true. But what I found is I can create almost half of the income that I've created in my earned income job through commercial real estate investments and keep the same amount of money in my household. So it's been an evolution of, okay, so now I've done well in this earned income business, but unless I 
transfer it into a passive income business. You know, Warren Buffett says, if you don't take earned income and create passive income with it, you'll work forever. And my mindset was, I want financial freedom. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was younger, but I didn't recognize that what I was doing was actually working myself into a great job. And the next evolution of that was, okay, now we have a good job. It's a good paying job. But if we don't take the money out of this business and put it somewhere else, we'll never really be financially free. And it's definitely a different sector. It's definitely a different space. But I would argue that it's almost easier because it's not transactional. Like you said before, right? It pays you once, there's problems. Um, every day is a Monday in the wholesale and flip business. You have to go and market. You have to find sellers. You have to sell the deal. You have to do the construction. Um, and it's not to say that commercial is easier, but in the sense that it pays you in perpetuity, it's better, I think. So, yeah. And then the tax advantages. So yeah, there's just so many differences. Um, and that's why we decided, hey, let's just go full time into this. We've we've kind of put down the residential business so that we can move into that. I well, hey, so I mean, it's one of those things where it's it's difficult. I think once you're in a business, to think that you can just leave it, that you can move on to the next thing. Sometimes it's hard to let that thing go. You've been building it for so long. You've invested so much into it, and as you mentioned, the wholesaling and flipping business is very transactional which means the work that I did six months ago is now paying off now. And so if I'm going to shut it down, I'm letting go of six months worth of work in order to go move on to something else. I've ran into that myself as I see a lot of really great opportunities to grow and you know, transition into other spaces. And I'm in the midst of doing that, but I still feel tied to that original baby, that thing that made me and successful. It's your baby. That, yeah, it yeah. has been. And that's the thing, right? And everybody, a lot of people, even in our own masterminds that we, that we know well, that have become friends and mentors, they're like, I don't know how you would do this. Mm-hmm. And it, it was almost forced upon us, right? I had a very, I had a consistent problem with acquisitions mm-hmm. to where I couldn't solidify that role. So I had to keep jumping into that role to go out and do sales, which is fine, but it's also time consuming. Mm-hmm. And then we had deals that were coming in on the commercial side And it was almost like we were put to the decision. It was like, you can solve one problem right now. What problem is it going to be that you solve? And if I had my, you know, my way, I would probably would have done both. I mean, in fact, we hired a chief operating officer to come in to run that business. And then he was with us for about 45 days when we decided to shut it down, which, you know, that's a big, scary problem. Um, but the transition was, hey, you know, you can only solve one problem at a time. I could solve the acquisition problem and it'd take me six months. Or I could solve this capital raising problem so that we could do deals and pay us in perpetuity. So it was almost forced upon us, but we've been flipping for 10 years. So to say that we're shutting the residential business down and people say, well, how did you deal with that? You know, was it hard? It was very hard, you know, to, to really trust. I just had a conversation with a mentor of mine this morning and he said, you know, the reason that I think you guys are going to be really successful is that you're willing to walk away from money, right? Because that was my comfort zone. It took me six years to create a comfort zone in that business. And now to put it down and walk away from something that's tried, true working and creating a lot of income was very difficult because it's scary. It's a new, you know, it's a new thing and we have to learn and pivot and grow through it again, just like we did in the, when we started the residential business. So yeah, it's difficult, but you know, and all the cliche, you know, growth uh, mindset things, right? (laughs) So for you in this, yes. So for you in this situation, I mean, you had started making progress towards the thing that you wanted and then you had a decision, which do I focus on? If I focus on both, they're both going to fail. Um, yeah. How would you recommend somebody who is going to follow in the same footsteps as you, somebody who wants to make a transition into another sector, whether that's out of their W-2 job into um, you know, real estate or whether it's from a sector in real estate into another space? How, how can they be thinking about that or how have you thought about that in the past? I think you have to you know, sit down with your family, with your business partners, and you have to write out kind of what your goals are, right? What are your what are the core values of your life? What are the goals of your life? What's the purpose behind what, why you're doing what you're doing? And be relentless about making sure that that's the thing you're focused on, right? There's a thousand distractions. Even in the very small sector of real estate, there's a thousand distractions. Um, 
I can do turnkey rentals. I can do the Burr effect. I can flip. I can wholesale. I, right? There's just all these little shiny objects all over the place. But some of them will help you accomplish your goals much faster, and some of them will take a longer time to help you accomplish those goals. So be relentless about how to get to the goal, and then make sure that the goal is defined so that you can get there. I, you know, I was <laughs> showing a house this morning. We're still wholesaling a, a deal a week or so just to keep the lights on right now. And I was just showing a house because we <laughs> let go of the entire team. And uh, the guy said to me, he's like, well, why don't you flip this house? Like, why, why would you wholesale it to me? It's a great deal. Why wouldn't you flip it? Mm-hmm. And I said, because honestly, it's a distraction from my goal. This doesn't help me. He's like, well, you'd make $75,000 on this flip. And I said, nonetheless, it will steal millions of dollars from me. And uh, that's the reality of it. It will split my focus. It will make me straddle two boats. And if I didn't have that goal written down and everybody in agreement with me that's going on that journey with me, then it would be easy to get distracted, right? $75,000 flip. Most people don't make that in a year. They'd say, absolutely, go flip that house. And we have to have the strength of mind to say, no, that's not what I want to do. It doesn't help me accomplish my goal. The probably the strongest thing that you could ever do is say no. So for, you know, mindset listeners, please press pause, go and listen to that again, because this is, this is some incredible advice. It's one of the hardest things to do is to say no to something when you know there's an opportunity right there, but it's so critically important to say no to the thing that doesn't get you to your goal. Otherwise, you're going to be ending up going down this path, get to a destination that you didn't really care about in the first place, and it will distract you from getting where you actually wanted to go. I know I've experienced that, so I'm sure everyone else has. So Steve, how do you get to the place where you have that kind of confidence and willpower to persevere, to be, have such a narrow focus that you actually you know, stay true to that value? Well, so two things. One, I love the metaphor of like the charge the mountain, be relentless, go get there, right? And then getting to the top of the mountain, looking around and realizing that you're on the top of the wrong mountain. So I think going back to what we were just saying, like making sure that your goal is is clearly defined so that you know that you're running up the right mountain. Um, I love that picture of, you know, your whole team is on one mountain, you're alone on the other one by yourself. And it's like, well, you both made it to the top of the mountain, but wrong mountain. So, so that's one. And then staying focused, you know, I'm I'm big into purpose driven lifestyle. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, so for me, there's a pyramid in life that's clearly defined. It's God, my wife, my business in that order. My wife is always number two because she's number two. She'll never be number three. Right. And being able to say that, this is the reason for why I do what I do. It keeps you very much on track. You can look at what you're going to do with the day and say, does that get me closer or further away from the life that I want to lead to the purpose that I have behind me? And I think that the why is what will always keep your guardrails in place so that you don't just go off. And so I, you're a culture index guy, right? You've done culture index and stuff. So I'm a 4.75 low centile B and for your lent or, or D. So for your listeners, what that means is when it comes to process and follow through and, you know, even you had to email me again and say, Hey, can you answer these questions again? Right. I sent them on Tuesday and that's just, I'm very, um, flighty in terms of, I get distracted very easily. Right. So my personality, I think that helps as an entrepreneur. I don't want to follow rules and I want to go do my own thing, but also very difficult with follow through. So unless you can put some guardrails in your life that say, this is the why that you're doing it, make sure that you don't fall off track. It's important for especially a guy like me to make sure that I know my why and my reason so that every day I'm waking up and I'm making sure that I'm going after those things. Yeah. Why is so inc- incredibly important. And you mentioned a personality profile test, which I'm a big believer in them. I, I think knowing yourself is critically important, but knowing your team, partners, people in your life is even more important. So the more that you can study that stuff, I think you can really get far. How has that impacted your business or your personal life? Just being able to you know, have a little bit better understanding of how personalities play together. Yeah. I mean, know thyself, right? It's a really big... 
uh, understanding. And I don't think the personality tests are the end all be all, right? I think they're a fantastic tool. I think that as we learn and grow, and especially if you're a spiritual person, you know, as as things change in your life and get pulled off of you and things get inserted into you, I think those things are probably a moving target to some extent. But I think at the very base level, it gets a really good snapshot as to how you're hardwired. doesn't mean you can't overcome those things, but how you're hardwired, it's really important. Um, and then with my team and even with my, my spouse, like we really know where each other's strengths and weaknesses are. And if you find the best people on your team that gel with you, they're typically opposite of, you know, they're filling in the gaps for you. And then recognizing, hey, I shouldn't be doing this, right? You don't want me um, doing the books, let's say, right? As, yeah. as, as a guy who's not super focused on detail orientation and is a very high level thinker, you probably don't want me being the bookkeeper. But you do want me casting the vision as to say, oh man, you know, we can, we can buy this skyscraper and this is how. So just really knowing the people on your team and how they're built and being able to... Um, step in and fill their gaps too and say, Hey, this is how I can help you. I know that you're in a place right now where you're doing something you don't want to do. How can I help? Yeah. Travis, my partner just, you know, yesterday he said, I have to go meet with this guy to get this paperwork signed. Right. And he was already committed to investing in our deal and we're very excited to have him, but he needs a little bit more handholding. And Travis is a three centile low B, right? So he's very introverted, very much wants to just sit in his room and get tasks done by himself. Meanwhile, I'm a, you know, 4.75 high B, like it's, that's my thing. And I'm like, Hey, why don't I go meet with the guy? I want to talk to him anyway, you know? So it's just really recognizing where people's strengths and weaknesses are. And if you're doing these jobs for freedom, it should also be for personal freedom. It should also be for that enjoyment out of life where you're doing the things that you like to do and easily you pull yourself out of the things that you don't like to do because they have to be done but if it doesn't sit in your personality profile to do that and you know somebody else on the team is built for that and you can hand that stuff off and not feel bad about it and it makes your life so much better it makes the job that's getting done better and it makes the team better because there's that interconnectedness you really do need each other so totally. i couldn't agree so you You've, uh, you've been kicking butt. You've made some transitions. Everyone who's not quite at your level right now is thinking to themselves, man, the Steve's guy, really, he's really got it. I bet he's never dealt with any adversity. But why don't you tell us a little bit about one of the times um, that you did face a little adversity, that you, you, know, you had failed or you'd, you had a learning moment. Tell me about when you had started the house raising business and what you came away after that, after that process. Yeah, so this is one of our failed businesses, and it was after Hurricane Sandy in 2012. We started our wholesale business in 2011. Hurricane Sandy came in, decimated the market. 2012, um, we kind of figured out some different things to do. And then 2013, we were seeing a lot of people getting taken advantage of by house raisers that were flying in from like Louisiana after Katrina. And there's not a lot of house raisers in this area, right? Actually, a previous guest here was Jason Yerusi is a house raiser in Jersey, but those guys only had so much capacity. So there's a lot of new people coming in, a lot of people price gouging these, uh, these people that lived on the water because they needed to lift their houses. So we came up with a, an idea that said, hey, here's a website. It'll give you multiple competitive bids on your house raise. It got a lot of traffic. It got a lot of um, press and it was free to the homeowner. And the problem is, right, you partnered with FEMA and the government, and they didn't change regulations as much as we thought that they would. And they're still dragging it on. Actually, it's 2019 now, and they still haven't completely changed uh, the flood maps and things like that in New Jersey. So it took a lot longer. It cost a lot more. It was a lot harder to get rolling. We hired a chief executive officer to come in and run that business on the day-to-day. -day. Uh, he left a job. He had a family. And that business eventually folded. You know, we just we could not get traction. We closed a couple of deals, but it never blew up the way that we thought it would. Um, so a lot of learning lessons from that, right? It was just you know it cost okay. us a lot of money and time. What what caused you to know when it was time to fold? Um, I mean, the CEO needed a paycheck, right? So the guy the guy has triplets and. 
you know, so that was a big one. He said, Hey, I can't do this for much longer. And we just assessed everything and said, look, I don't want to put you in a bad financial spot. So go find a job. We'll pay you until you do. Um, and he had to go find another job and we just, we were starting our, you know, we were still in the flip business, so we couldn't run two businesses. So we said, you know what, the market's just not here. Let's leave the company open. Maybe one day we'll come back to it. And, uh, we never did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you got to this point where things just weren't going in the direction that you thought they were going to go. And you had to make that decision that, Hey, I got to choose the one that's, that's actually working. Yep. I still have bills to pay. So does everybody else. So although I thought it was a brilliant idea, I still do. I still think it could help a lot of people. Um, timing just wasn't right. And you just can't force some stuff, right? You have to be wise to know when it's time to walk away. What would have you done differently in that business if you were going to start over today and, and start fresh? So now I have a much better handle on what marketing looks like. We didn't, we didn't even join the single family mastermind yet to have an idea of how to reach the consumer. So I think we would have been a lot better at discerning who our target market was and how to get to them. Um, and that would have probably driven more leads, which would eventually drive more traffic. Um, but we didn't really have the full team in place, right? I say CEO, but that guy was banging on doors trying to get people to lift their houses with us. That, it's just not, it wasn't a business. Yeah. It was an entrepreneurial venture. Um, but in hindsight, now that we have built businesses, now we kind of understand systems and processes and marketing and things like that. That would have probably been, uh, we would have done, done things pretty differently. I think a big thing for people to remember here, you know, from, for all the entrepreneurs out there, everyone's got great ideas. There's a ton and ton of great ideas. And I know I've experienced this before where I'm like, this is going to be amazing. We're going to do great things with this. Yeah. And for some reason, doesn't work out. And there's this whole thing called marketing and sales that apparently make the transaction happen. So no matter how good of an idea you have, if you don't have a way of getting to the customer and getting the customer to understand your value, things just don't work out. And we've faced that in our, in our single family business at sure. times where the market shifts and you have to shift with it. You have to be able to be creative. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful learning lesson that I think we can all take away from that experience Steve, and uh, thank you for having it. But more importantly, thank you for being willing to share it with us. Yeah, of course. I mean, I think crashing and burning creates a ton of life lessons, right? It, it, you can grow through it and you can learn from it. Um, and I, I was just listening to, uh, you had Greg Dickerson, right, on your podcast too. And I was listening to his podcast and he was talking about how, yeah, look, it's, it, you're going to grow through these things or you can decide to get really upset and kick holes through walls, but one's going to grow you. One's not. And I've been fortunate enough to be around mentors that even, you know, you know, they always say like the cliche, I don't, I don't fail. I either win or learn. And, uh, I mean, that's the truth though. If you are not teachable from those experiences, then you'll probably only fail once and never get back on the horse. For us, there's no, there's no plan B, right? There's just, we're going to make it happen. It can be hard. I mean, people fall into those emotional places where it's like, oh, I failed. So there I'm a failure. And it can be hard to pull yourself back up. But the only way you can succeed is by learning from it and keep moving forward. And obviously, that's what what you've done. And that's why you've built a couple businesses since that have made you millions of dollars. Um, so tell us, you know, I ask this question to a lot of very successful people. Why do you think you've succeeded in an industry that's pretty challenging where so many else, so many others have given up? Um, well, one, I think it's just the humility to get around people that are doing it better than you are, right? Learning from those folks and not trying to reinvent the wheel and asking for help. I think that's a, I think that's a big one. Uh, yeah. For the first five years of our business, we were on an island. We didn't have anybody around us, and we were just trying to figure it out on our own because we're smart guys, right? Well, that's that's dumb. That's not the right way to do it. Getting yeah. around people that are actually doing it and can show you some tips and tricks that'll save you millions of man hours and millions of dollars over the life of your business. That's that's probably a pretty smart move, right? So I love when I'm around people that are poo pooing like mastermind groups and meetup groups and things like that because they think that they can do it themselves. Those are typically the people that aren't doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. The most successful people that I'm around are, you know, buying planes and things of that nature. Those are the guys that I'm in masterminds with. Mm -hmm. So 
So that's number one is just being humble enough to say that you're not the smartest guy in the room and go find that smart guy and try to attach yourself to them. And then perseverance. I mean, you just can't give up. Um, you know, we never had a plan B. I mentioned that before. There is no, um, there is no backup plan. Like this is it. Right. And it always has been. It was always looking forward, not ever looking backward unless it was to analyze what went wrong and learn from it. But it wasn't saying, oh, you know, let, let me go look for a job. In the first couple of years, I'll be honest, right? I, I was looking for sales jobs. I was good at sales. I could go make $150,000 a year. And my wife is a very, pro, like, she's process oriented. She's uh, security driven. And I mean, God grew her a lot through giving her me because I don't need security, right? <laughs> she wanted a paycheck and I was like, no, I won't do it. But as I started looking around for these other jobs to go back into because the, you know, it was hard in the beginning, my wife was like, please don't like, just don't go get a job. You're going to be miserable. Like just go, you, you can make this work and you know, I'm going to support you through it. And, and that really motivated me and having the persistence to continue on and not have a plan B was, was huge. Not too many people do that, but that's a really big idea there, folks. And I really hope you guys will execute that and put that to place in your life. You know, you need to be all in on the things that you're doing. If you're not all in, then you're, you're all out because you can't just put a little bit here and a little bit there and hope that everything turns out. It takes a lot of effort, energy, and more important focus to succeed. Uh, another thing I really want to underline there is the power of the mastermind. You know, we met through a mastermind. We grew a lot. I, you know, over those two years that we were in that group together, um, I had an incredible time. But more importantly, my whole business went from zero to, you know, over a million dollars in revenue per year and, you know, buying and selling over 200 houses without any experience. It's strictly because I surrounded myself with people that were smarter than me, like you, and, uh, was able to learn from them. And so I think whenever you guys hit a plateau, go and try to look around. Who are you hanging out with? And are you the top dog? Because if you're the top dog in the room, you're in the wrong room. You know, That's right. You got to find gals and, and guys who are doing good things and, and go after it. So on, on a note like that, um, talk to me a little bit about how you define success and what success is to you, Steve. So I still stole this from a book um, that John Maxwell wrote, right? His definition of success is similar to mine, which is the people that know me best to love me most, which means my wife, my kids, my friends, my family. Um, those are the people that are supposed to know you the best, right? And they should love you the most. The people that it's easy to go on a work trip weekend and for those people to love you, right? Over a couple of days, right? It's like, oh man, this guy was so cool. He was really nice. And I had a great time with him. Um, you know, but does my wife feel that way every day when I get home from work, right? Do my kids feel like I'm giving them? And I look, we all fall short of this. So I don't want this advice that I give or these, you know, quips that we talk about to be like, oh, well, this guy's just got it all together. There's days where I come home from work and the kids are already in bed and I, I'm like, man, I, I wish I was able to get home sooner, right? What am I going to do tomorrow that will help me get home sooner to make sure that I'm putting these things on my calendar, right? And some days, there's just work that overwhelms you. There's just things that you have to do as an entrepreneur to get things done. Um, but my wife and kids know that the paramount goal is to be able to spend all my time with them. So this is the push now to make sure that we don't have to do that push in a couple of years. Um, but that's really the definition of success for me, right? Is for the people that know me best to love me most. And first and foremost in that is my relationship with God. Like, am I doing what I need to do to be known by him in a way that he loves me the most? Am I working towards that relationship with him as well as my wife and as well as the relationships that are yeah. around me? So with that definition, we're all on a journey. Do you feel like, do you feel like you're successful? I do. Yeah. I, I think we're getting there. I think that there has been a lot of uh, shaping and reshaping over the years that, you know, I have a great relationship with God. I have a great relationship with my wife. I have a great relationship with my kids. Um, 
there's days, you know, Travis just told me the other day, he was like, yeah, I hate you when you're like that. And it's because I got really like stressed out, right? We were right in the middle of a $4 million capital raise, a million and a half got, dollar guy fell off and we needed to go back to the drawing board and we had a short period of time to do it. And raising money is really hard. Um, having a lot of conversations, trying to pull in people to commit into your deals and stuff. It's, it's hard, especially when you're painted into a corner like that. And I wasn't the version of my best self, right? I get stressed out and I get snappy and I, I don't, you know, respond as well as I should. And I think we all kind of go through that sometimes. But over the last decade, yeah, I've gotten a lot better at managing those emotions and managing how I respond. And so it's a work in progress. Like you said, it is a journey, um, not a destination. Am I better today than I was yesterday? Yes. And in that way, I feel successful because we're growing in the right direction. That, that's it, buddy. That's it. That's all you can do. That's the achiever in you that saying, I can do a little bit better and I'm going to. Yeah. So I can definitely appreciate that. So from a habits perspective, what are some of your keystone habits, the things you do on a daily or weekly basis that have led to your success? Yeah, I'd like to say that I wake up at the same time and go to the gym and do all these things. Um, but that's a lie, right? The things that I 100% will do is make sure that I'm home for dinner with my wife and kids. I try to get to the gym three, four times a week. Um, you know, it's it really depends on a lot of different factors. You know, I, what time do I go to bed? What time do I wake up? You know, there was a period of time in my life where I was very consistent about waking up at five and reading in the morning and then going to the gym and then spending breakfast with the kids and things like that. And, you know, that, that was good for a time and a season. But habitually, what I really do is I, I make sure that I get into the Bible every day. At some point, I read. Um, make sure that I'm reading and praying and try to do some activity, right? Whether that's just going for a bike ride or going to the gym or something like that. It, you know, everybody kind of talks about their activity level. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. And I am really good at forgiving myself when it doesn't happen, right? I think you have to be gentle with yourself. Um, because if you try to get super straight, like I love Jocko Willink, right? I, I can't wait to go and see him speak and, October and I'm excited to to be around him and listen to extreme ownership. And that dude is about just every minute detail, making sure that you're squeezing it and being relentless about that stuff. And um, I just, I'm not really built that way. I, I like to be, you know, I'm more gentle with myself. I'm more, you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm doing like the critical things on my list that day. Mm -hmm. Am I making sure that I'm touching these uh, investors? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? But so habit-wise, it's uh, it kind of varies, right? It's not like every day I have this hard regimented life. It's I, I make sure that I am reading, praying, spending time with my family, and then um, I try to I try to map out my day in the mornings to say this is the stuff that needs to get done for the business that I can't be distracted from. Good stuff. Very good stuff. So we've made it to my favorite part of the show, the growth rapid fire round, where the questions are quick, but the answers don't need to be. Tell us what's a book that's impacted your life the most or one you're, you're excited about right now. Um, yeah. So I, I think the most impactful book was the Bible, finally reading that. I heard a lot of things about the Bible that I was told and not necessarily that I gleaned for myself and uh, didn't become a believer in Christ until I was, uh, I don't know, 27, 26. So later in life, I was seeking and searching and really wanted to know truth and what spiritual spiritual truth looked like. And I heard a lot of things and I listened to a lot of people. And um, finally, I took it upon myself to say, yeah, I'm just going to read this thing and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on trial, basically. I'm going to figure out if it's true or if it's not. And through that journey, um, you know, I became pretty solid in my faith and kind of had a better understanding of who God was and who he wanted me to be. And that was life-changing. That's great. We hear that from a lot of folks. What's another book other than the Bible? It's a, it's a I know that's kind of the easy one, right? Crowd favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, I Never Split the Difference is probably the best sales book that I've ever read. I have that on auto, um, on my audio constantly. Every time I drive, I'm getting into it and gleaning more from that book. I met and saw Chris Voss in New York City. I took my whole team to go uh, to a day seminar with him. And the tactics that he employs for negotiation are bar none. I think it'll help you in any business that you've ever been in, that you ever can get into. I think it helps you with your relationships. Um, fantastic book. Never split the difference. 
I love that book, and I am so excited to uh, interview Chris coming up here. So, uh, are you? Definitely. That is exciting. Excited. Apparently, the first podcaster to interview everyone on the on the uh, on, on the, the Black Swan. Team. So, uh, awesome. look for that episode in the next couple months. Here, guys. Um, from an inspiration standpoint, who were some of your mentors, the people you learned from and looked up to, and how did they influence your career? Yeah. So I think we started off with my grandfather, right? That was certainly an influencer. Um, and some guys that you know, I mean, Bill Allen, um, you know, he was a big help in the beginning when we started to figure out how to, uh, systemize and, uh, grow our business. Um, Corey Peterson, a great friend and mentor and, uh, Sean Kruk. Those are the guys that we were doing commercial deals with. Sean and I got together via literally a Facebook message and he was on, uh, I'm going to blow this. I'm not sure if he was in Jamaica or Turks and Caicos. I guess it doesn't matter. He was on a beach and he was trying to raise capital for a deal. And we got on the phone and uh, we were actually in Baltimore together, Stephen, you and I, and that was during one of these masterminds that we were at. I had a phone conversation with him and then we flew down to Orlando. We walked this site and boom, we're in a $30 million deal together. So Sean uh, took a flyer on us and it's been an amazing relationship and just seeing how these guys do business, how they are relentless about what they do, the financial freedom that they've created and how they get to translate that into their family lives has, has been incredible and really inspiring. That's so cool. And so finally, from a purpose perspective, what drives you to live your best life every day? So I think I, I try to look at life with an eternal lens, right? So mm -hmm. I think that um, as everybody is on their own journey and growth process, I think it's important to plant seeds with people to, um, you know, to, to be the light in a dark place, if you will, to, to kind of show people that there's something different about us um, and to, to really just be relational about it. Right. So I think that the purpose is eternal. I think that all of the things that we have here are temporal, um, the cars and the houses and all those things, but human beings and human beings souls are eternal. And if we can touch those people and impact those people, even if it's through business, right, it's, uh, can we love on people better? And to me, that's, that's a really big barometer of how we act and do business and how we do life together. And, uh, you know, if we can do that a little bit better every day, then that's a good, that's a good one. That's awesome. I love that. Well, this has been so much fun. I really appreciate you so much. Where can people find out more about you and get in touch? Yeah. So the name of the company is Integrity Holdings Group. So integrityhg.com. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook. Um, you can just reach out to me at Stephen at integrityhg.com. And we're, uh, we're just grateful to be here and really appreciate you having us on and telling our story. And we're, uh, we're blessed to tell it and we're grateful to be able to share it with you and your listeners. And thanks for taking the time with us. Amazing. This was so much fun. I look forward to the next time we get to hang out, buddy. Cool, man. Me too. 